Hey everybody, welcome to the Soberful Podcast, and I am delighted today to welcome Dr. Sarah Michaud. Welcome. Thanks, Monica. It's so great to be here. It's I so great to be here. We, we had a bunch of like false starts where we tried to get together and it didn't work. And that happens sometimes when people are sick and there's kids Absolutely. and all, all that Absolutely. stuff's going on. But I'm really yes. pleased because uh, um, Sarah has a fantastic book, which we're going to talk about, which is called uh, Co-Crazy, One Psychologist's Recovery from Codependency and Addiction. Love the cover. Um, so... Uh, Dr. Sarah is a clinical psychologist who specialized in addiction and codependency for over 30 years. And a lot of your story is at 20 years of sobriety was understanding like codependency. So why don't we start, like, give us an overview of your your story. And then I want to talk about codependency because it is a really important part of the sobriety journey that lots of people come unstuck with. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the one thing that I think really people struggle with, whether they're just getting sober or in long-term sobriety, both. So I got, thanks, Veronica. I got sober in 1984. I literally just celebrated 40 years, which is absurd. Wow. I was 24 when I got sober. So I got sober in the 80s. (laughs) It was the cocaine, cocaine time. I'm sure there's cocaine time now, but in the 80s, it was huge. Yeah. So um, alcohol and, and cocaine were my, my drugs of choice. And, you know, like yourself, I mean, I got sober and my life took off. I went back to school. I went to graduate school. You know, things got busy. Life happened. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, and I got married in 1999. And I always say it was the shortest marriage in history, but I got a son out of it. So he's 23 now. So that gives you some context. Um, I got married a second time when my son was four, I got divorced when he was six months old, which is, we could talk about parenting and all that stuff at another time, but that's a whole story in itself. Um, and what happened is at 20 years sober, my second husband, who was 15 years sober when I married him relapsed. And it's that classic story of they have surgeries, they have one surgery, they get on some opiates and then they have some anxiety and they get on some Ativan. And then the next thing you know, I'm coming home and he's asleep on the couch at four in the afternoon. And I'm like, you know, you don't know why, did he take too many pain meds? Is he, you know, so over time it was revealed, it took a while that um, he had relapsed on these pain meds and Ativan and all this other stuff. And I think why I wrote the book and why I feel so strongly about codependency recovery, which again, we'll get into the definition because for me, it's changed over time, Mm. is that here I was, I was a psychologist. I've been, you know, I worked at McLean Hospital, a very well-known hospital. I've been educated. I have a PhD, all that stuff. I've been so Brazilian years. I'm working with addicts. I'd been in Al-Anon, I think by then 10 years. And it was really hard for me. So Mm. I thought to myself, if I have all of these things going for me and I still struggled, then this is a really, really, really tricky thing to navigate. And so that's why I wrote the book, because at that time, it took me quite a while Again, because you know addicts. I mean, they don't tell the truth. So it's like you're living with someone who's lying, but they seem, uh, you know, like they're under the influence, but they're telling me they're not. You know, that whole, I call it crazy town. You know, you enter what I call crazy town, where you start doubting your reality and you don't know what's happening and you you don't trust what you see. And um, lots of feelings happening, lots of crazy thinking happening. So that happened in um, 2000, around six. And um, no, sorry, got married in 2006. That happened around 2010. And um, I asked him to leave in 2011. And then this kind of recovery, this kind of second codependency recovery journey happened because I'd had other, what I call bottoms of codependency where, you know, a relationship implodes and you wonder why, and then you look at your behaviors and see a lot of your codependency. So I don't know if that was enough of a, a start, but go ahead. Well, you know, it, it's it's great because um, I always try and tell this to my clients, right? Yes. Like, don't think that I'm walking around in this like, oh, state of holy right. zen of never, right? We right. also have, you know, st- I've had stuff in my yes. 
my time of sobriety. So can we start with, can you explain what codependency is? Yeah, I mean, this is going to maybe even confuse your audience more, but what I believe codependency is, is the inability to be your authentic self. Because Hmm. basically codependency is completely based on who I am is a response to the world. So it's my behaviors, my thinking, and my feelings are all about my fear of what you're going to think or what you're going to do or what you're going to say. So it's, it's basically I'm responding to people in my life out of fear. So nothing I do is really what I want to do or what I want to say. It's all based on my fear of what someone else is going to do. So, I mean, the early, you know, and the early definitions, like back in the sixties, I know, you know, this, like, You know, even Bill W. started AA with his wife, Lois. It was all about Lois's behaviors because of Bill's drinking. So it was this focus on what then was called the co-addict when I started working. You know, the person who's married to an alcoholic because it was learned and, and realized that it wasn't just the alcoholic who's behaving in this odd way under the influence. But the co-addict has all these other symptoms, right? They have rage, they have anxiety, they have fears, uh, they act out, they do all these other things. So this focus on kind of the partner of the alcoholic was developed. And then Codependent No More came out, which was all about being a partner of an alcoholic. And then all these adult children books and codependent books. And really, it they're all the same symptoms. I mean, that's really what I saw is is it's not just someone who's married to an addict. My brothers or my relatives or my clients who weren't married to addicts had these fears of what other people thought. So it's not just being married to an addict. It's really this inability to say your truth, to express your feelings, to do the behaviors you want. And so I'm, I'm creating more of a generalized term because everybody I meet, whether they're an alcoholic, not alcoholic, in recovery, not in recovery, have fears of being themselves. And it's funny, you said in your book something about authenticity and, and you know coming home to yourself. You didn't use those terms. And literally the title of my group that I've done on and off for years is called Coming Home to Yourself. Mm. because so many of these behaviors is about, again, responding to the external world rather than the mantra in my recovery is, what do I want? What do I need? What do I want? What do I need? What do I want? What do I need? Mm. Instead of what do you want? What do you need? What are you going to think? Are you going to get upset with me? Whatever. So my definition is very general because I think everybody struggles with it and it's on a spectrum you know, I've seen, you know, I give the example of a new mother, right, who, you know, came to see me and her child was was like, I think at the time, like 18 months old. And she walked into the office and she was anxious. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I left my child with my husband. And I said, for the first time. And it was like, you know, almost two years in. And I said, well, and just her fear of the of not being able to trust and let go of what's going to happen it, really what she thought is what her husband was going to do but really it's about her own fear of what her you know what i'm saying it's really and i say this in the book codependency is not about the other person we think it's about the other person but it's about our own inability and you talk about this in your book of tolerating what's happening when someone else is having feelings and oh, is oh let me just let me just like, tolerate what is happening yes. when someone else is having feelings. Yes, I just I got, I just want to stay there because that tolerate Go. tolerating. Yes, that's it. That's yes. it. Tolerating yes. what is happening when yeah. someone else is having big feelings. Yes, unpleasant negative feelings, and not and, doing anything, and not doing anything. Right. Oh. <gasps> That is everything. It is. It is. That is a skill. That is a skill. Oh my God. I I have two elementary school kids. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Parents cannot tolerate. 
their kids' feelings, so they fix it and save them. Veronica, we could do a show just on <laughs> parents because yes. I have such a button on codependency and parenting because to me, oh, I could get tearful thinking about this. You watch it, and what happens over time is these parents become prisoners to their kids when they're teenagers because yes. they haven't set a limit since they were yep. three, mm -hmm. and they thought that was hard. Well, just wait. Yeah. And the other thing is, it's such a disservice to the child because mm -hmm. they don't develop their own self-efficacy and self-esteem and realizing they're capable. I mean... All right, I'm going to just say this one thing. A friend of my son's who went off to college and I had uh, coffee with his mom. She wanted some, some support. She was, get this, still calling her child at college in the morning to wake him up. Now, is that about the child? Now, she'll say to me, oh, I'm worried, you, you know, he won't get, no. You can't tolerate your anxiety around the fact that he may miss a class. But if he doesn't start missing classes, he's never going to learn how to get up in the morning. So that's an extreme example. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I've talked about this before, and I went, let's not go off on this tangent. But my husband used to be the dean of a business school, and he would regularly have mums. And it's always mums. Always It's mums. always mums in the office. Yes advocating not yes. not not just for their undergraduate for their their oh. their their postgraduate and 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 he said that what what oh. shocked him the most was not the mothers saying oh the grade or the dorm room or whatever it is is that the kid wasn't even remotely embarrassed oh my that's God. what shocked him the most they were 22 and they just weren't embarrassed they, they were just that's what how it's always They've been never experienced that and i mean think about that that they never are learning how to navigate their own feeling states. I mean, yeah. as a parent, that to me is our biggest job, to be a witness, to be supportive, to give space to our kids having feeling states. I mean, and again, it sounds so basic product. It's like, we're humans, we have feelings. And yet parents think it's pathological to be sad about a bad grade or something. It's like, no. That's mm. called being human. hundred yeah. percent. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. So I want to get back to your story. Could you tell okay. us a little, so I, sadly, this is, I've heard this story. I had a, a good friend who used to work for me years ago, really solidly sober, committed, yes. married, yeah. all the things. Yes. Heroin was his drug of choice. And then he had a um, life-threatening car accident. I mean, he, uh, he nearly died. The opiates. And the opiates. Yeah, and he went straight back there. And I've I've heard that more than once and it breaks my heart. Absolutely. And it's such it's such a killer. I mean, it's so weird because when I was in graduate school, I went to graduate school in San Diego in California and I cracked a rib and I got a medication. And I took it for three weeks as prescribed and and then it was over. And the week after the medication ran out, I remember I was like really angry and edgy and blah, blah, blah. And I called this doctor and they said, well, you were on Vicodin. And I had never taken opiates. Like I was not an opiate person and I never had an injury. And I remember thinking at that moment, like, oh, <laughs> this is this is what they're talking about because I kind of looked back to the three weeks on the medication and I felt really great. And I had, you know, but I never even knew what it was at that time. So, I mean, I get it. I mean, and now with Oxycontin and stuff, but so um, my husband at the time had, he had a motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. And so that was like three months of on the couch with a scapula broken, a collarbone broken, that was the beginning. And then it just kind of over time without me knowing was getting other medications, you know, then had some other accident. I can't remember at the time, like either a knee thing. So it was just med seeking basically. And so it took a while because addicts, you know, they're always gonna tell you exactly what you wanna hear. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get my resume out today. I'm going to, you know, every time you confront something, there's always, that's why I talk about in the book, sticking with the facts, which is part of what you do in an intervention with alcoholics, right? That's what interventions really are. You stick with facts and it's the same with codependency. It's like, okay, these are the facts. You've been on the couch for this period of time. You're not working. We're not relating or whatever. And you know, is it hard to do the bottom line? And a lot of clients I've seen over the years, you know, I can't ask them to leave. The biggest fear of someone who's with a person who's relapsed is that they're going to die. I mean, and the same with parents, parents of kids mm -hmm. that are addicts, it's mm -hmm. always they're going to die. And the thing that you have to eventually get to is, and this is going to sound really harsh, is that I have to save my own life because I can't save theirs. Mm. And so what happened, there was this moment ugh, when my son at the time was probably say, say he was eight and my husband would have him on Tuesday afternoons when I was at work. And one Tuesday I came home from work and he wasn't home and my son wasn't home. And the babysitter who babysat intermittently showed up with my son. And I said, what happened? And she said, I got a call that he couldn't pick him up. And that was it for me. It was like, oh, now it's affecting my son. Hmm. And now it's over. So at that point, I asked him to leave. And for two years, we kind of, he went to treatment. Then he went to his sober house. Then he relapsed and he, so it was like a two year kind of trying to make it work, but ultimately it didn't work and I just had to move on. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's a very tricky thing. And again, now we're talking about someone who's relapsed at which, you know, the longer you stay sober, you meet a lot of people. It's a lot of people marry people, you know, or other sober people and stuff happens. You know, it's amazing that you can marry someone who's sober and not, it doesn't even occur to you that they're going to relapse. I mean, it yeah, well, occur to me. yeah, I mean, it wouldn't occur to me at that, that length of sobriety. No. Right. 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 What was his drug of choice when he was like, before he got sober? He was just anything. anything. He was okay. speed, alcohol. He had hit a really low bottom. Wow. And, you know, and part of his story, which was fascinating is he had surgeries that were not necessary. Hmm. So, I mean, he was like to get pain meds, which seems shocking that a doctor was in surgery that wasn't necessary. But um, anyways, yeah, so he and what's really cool right now is he had three adult children when I married him. And recently his oldest son got sober, which is very cool. So, yeah, it's I mean, that's all we can do. Be a loving presence, be a support. And a lot of times being a support is asking someone to leave. And it's the same thing like we were just talking about with parenting. The thing about codependency is, and what I can get infuriated about, is staying with an alcoholic, you know, in the early days, it was like if you went to an Al-Anon meeting, oh, now we're really going to get letters, is... um you know, it was like people went to get the person sober. And of course, that's not what it's about. You don't get people sober. You go to work on yourself. Yeah. But a lot of people stayed, stayed in the relationships. And my feeling was that's not helping them. You know, it's it doesn't save anyone to stay and have the person not have any consequences. So, again, we could do another show on that another time, but but yeah, I mean, and I work with a lot of people now. I sponsor a bunch of people in a 12-step program and I do groups and, you know, get the book out there and stuff. But, um, you know, people with long-term sobriety, this is it. This is the place where people are still struggling. And it's really that fear um, in a relationship, but I can't say what, like you said, I can't say what I mean, mean what I say without saying it mean. I can't just tell my truth. I can't, you know, and in lots of situations where I'm sponsoring people, it's amazing to me, married people who just can't, who can't tell their truth. And that's codependency because it's fear of their partner having feelings, but really what it's about 
is fear that I'm going to have feelings and I might have to actually take an action step. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So how, I'm just writing this down because I love it so much. Yeah. Fear of the partner having feelings. It, it, we, we are all terrified of everyone else's feelings. We are, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, really were, I know, but it's not, it's really not that. It's fear of what I'm going to feel. Yes. So, uh, you know, yeah. when I walk people through activations, like, like with you, if you think about, geez, what am I afraid to say to my partner or my child or whatever, because they're going to have some experience. And then you think, but really, what am I afraid to feel? Am I afraid that I'm going to feel like they're going to abandon me? Am I going to feel afraid that I'm going to feel some kind of rage? Am I going to feel um, scared that they're going to get mad at me? And really, the issue is that the fear is never about the present moment. You know this, it's always about the past. So say, for example, if I have a fear of telling my partner something, because one of my things is they'll get mad at me because my father was always enraged. And so if I'm afraid of that, then, okay, what am I really afraid of? And I ask the question, what is this reminding me of right now? And a lot of times when I do some writing, I come up with an example of an experience where I'm having the same bodily sensations. And that's really what I work on processing because it's all just, I mean, I see us as these computers, you know, we have these histories, we have all these locked thoughts and feelings and behaviors, and we're just coming from that place rather than, oh, I got triggered. What's that about? It's not about the present. It's about the past. Let's work it through. I mean, it sounds much more simple now when I'm saying it, but uh, but it is. It's always about the past to me, anyways. Yeah, but the past shows up in the present in our present yes. all the time. Yeah. How? Um, okay, so how? What was your rock bottom with this, and how did you get out of it? Well, I had two of them. One was um, I talk about in the book where I married a guy in 1999, my son's dad, and. Um, he uh, met him in graduate uh, when I was in graduate school in California. He was very charming. Uh, I tell some funny stories about him because when I met him, he was living in a van. He had sold he has sold an advertising company and he was traveling around the country. And um, so we met passionate love affair. He lived in Vancouver and um, we moved here. I got a job at McLean and we moved here in, I think, 97. And, um, after I had a child, I had, a, I got pregnant, had Bo, my son, and that relationship just really imploded. And I, I mean, I joke about when you're married to a narcissist and you have a kid, you know, the attention, when the attention goes off of them, it gets pretty dicey. So, um, and you know, he's still in his life and he's lovely and Bo, he and Bo have a great relationship, but that relationship imploded after my son was born because just couldn't navigate that together. So when Bo was six months old, I left that relationship. And that was really my first bottom of, it was really upsetting for me because I got married when I was 39. I mean, hmm. I waited a long time. So I was, I was 37. I hear you. Well, I hear you. So yeah. Much in common. You know, reading your book, I was like, we have so much in common. Uh. Um, and so I was so attached to like this hat, you know, I waited so long. I had this freaking enormous wedding and, um, and then I am in, you know, my son's six months old and I'm like, it's over. So it was dealing with a lot of grief and I really wanted to look at what got me here. What is happening? Why did I marry him? Why did I choose him? Why was I so focused on him? He had a depression and he was he was also in recovery, but depressed. And that's a whole other thing that can trigger someone's codependency. I always focused on him. And here I'm working at a psych hospital all day. And then I'm coming home and feeling like I need to take care of him. And then I have a child and I can't do it all. So um, that was kind of the first bottom. You know, went to Al-Anon, got into a lot of reading and recovery and therapy around codependency. And... Um, thought I was doing pretty well. And then married George, my second husband, and, you know, really great for the first few years and things going well. And then again, 
this kind of relapse and a resurfacing of these same issues. So, you know, that was kind of my second bottom. And, um, you know, and really not wanting to do that again and, th- and really doing a deep dive on what is happening here. What, you know, when I'm of the school, and I think you talked about this too, of like, you know, the existential, like, I loved existential psychotherapy as well. Me too. Me too. Oh, like, uh, that's, I'm, I'm an existential psychotherapist. Me I too. I love it. I totally yeah. love it. So, and this is part of recovery too, but the whole idea of taking responsibility, like I believe I'm responsible. You know, I mean, have I been victimized in my life? Yes. Um, but it's the both and. We've all been victimized to a certain degree, but am I responsible for my life today? Yes. So that's my bottom line mantra. And I really want to figure out so I don't keep making the same mistakes. And I also, I think of missing pieces, compassion. A lot of people I work with, like, don't have compassion for themselves. That whole, like, missing Mm. piece of, like, I've done these behaviors for this period of time. Oh, well, no judgment. Like, I, I really believe, and I don't know if you do, that we do the best we can at any given moment in our yeah. life. Yeah. Because that's all I can do. Yeah. So if I'm having another divorce and I'm, you know, my husband, that's just what's happening. It's like judging the experience is not going to help me. So, um, and what's really interesting, and now I'm off on a tangent, is I, in the last several months, started dating someone and I haven't been in a relationship in a long time. I dated two men since, since my husband and I separated, you know, sober people, but it just didn't work out. Um, And I'm telling you, you know, I often say like the first 90 days of a relationship, every issue you've thought was resolved comes up and it's totally true. I mean, here I am, I'm 64. I've written a book on codependency. I'm sober 40 years. And suddenly it's like, what? What is percolating? Because intimacy and that connection, that those types of feelings always bring up those old wounds. Mm-hmm. And again, I may think they're all healed, but when you're not in a relationship and in the last 10 years of my life, I've been really happy. I've done a lot of great things. But when you're not risking that kind of bottom line intimacy stuff, you don't, it's, there's not an opportunity for this to come up. So I've been growing now, and now in another level of this stuff. So it's fascinating. Can you uh, just explain what existential psychotherapy is? But- oh, God, can I? Like to, in an- to me, it's all about the experience of being human. It's like an ontological exploration. And I think it's about how Irvin Yalom was the, I don't know, did you read some yeah, Irvin? Yeah, you know, yeah, Love's yeah. Executioner was one of my yeah, favorite yeah, books. yeah. That was the first one I read in my course. (laughs) Yes. And and existential group psychotherapy, I remember reading in a group psychotherapy course. But just all these common aspects of being human that we all experience, meaning what's it like to be responsible? What's it like to be free or have freedom? All of those different aspects of being a human being. And that's why I love it. And it, it boils down to what, what made me fall in love with it is it boils down to it's not what happened to you. It's how you choose to respond to what happened to you. And when I realized Amen. that, I was like, that, that is what I believe. Because yes. every, we all, and this is not to, everybody has wounds and trauma and things. It's not, it. not to diminish, you know, no. we don't go like, well, get over it. No. We don't do that. We, we no. really validate and acknowledge the pain and. You know, what, that's a big part of the work is like, whoa, hold on a minute. Like that happened, man, that's, that's yes. huge. Yes. And then we can get to the point eventually, how are yes. you going to choose to respond to that? Right. And don't you think, I mean, I really think in my practice over the 30 years, the discerning factor between someone who really took off and did really well and someone who really would get stuck is someone who was stuck not totally ready to own and take responsibility and know that they're the ones responsible for what's going to happen now when you're still, and you did a podcast on when you're still blaming and pointing the finger and saying, you know, that's why I did this. You can't move forward. I don't know. What were you going to say? Um, I think that everybody gets to a 
cliff edge in their sobriety. Yes. And what you see is if I jump, I have to be completely responsible for the yes. experience I want to have. And that yeah. feels utterly terrifying. Yes. Or I have to go back to how it was. Yes. And I remember getting to that point and going, feeling like I don't want to jump. Yes. But I cannot go back. I, I yes. cannot. I cannot. So I'm going to jump and I'm going to trust when I jump that I'll get caught, even though I'm terrified out of my mind. Yes. And I see, I, that is one of the things I've seen over and over in my work. It sponsoring people and my professional work is you have to take complete responsible for the experience, what you, what you want to have in life. That's it. And it's really terrifying to do that. And I want to say that's full adulthood. And I'm totally with you. And uh, I, I think it's probably one of the most terrifying things you'll ever do. And I also think it's the only way. Yes. And it's not only one time. I mean, no, <laughs> because I mean, at my age, I've had many of those moments where it's like, uh oh, now I've got to jump again. I mean, yeah. so it is. And again, I think there's a process of acknowledging what's happening. Like you say, validating people's experience. The older I get, I really think it's all about grief. I mean, I'm getting my, I feel like my clinical interpretation of the world now has gotten narrower and narrower, narrower yeah. because in the big picture over time, it's how we process our grief because it's something everybody experiences and people don't know how to navigate. And um, yeah. So anyways, but yes, owning it. And again, not that horrible things don't happen or have happened or still happen. Yeah. I mean, and that are not your fault. Yeah, that are no. absolutely not your fault. Shit happens. Yes, 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 yes. But yeah, but it, it's all about, and it's all about power. You know, when I stand in the place of this was awful. It's not what I wanted. I didn't ask for it. Didn't volunteer for it. Nevertheless, it happened. I'm going to choose my response to it. Yes. I take back my power, and yes. that's the most important thing. Yes. Is is that we we then have access to our full power? Yes, and I, I want to say uh, people listening to this, uh, it, it's not once you do it, like it's such an easier way to live, actually, <laughs> right? It's not hard. Well, it's the, like the, living the, the other way is hard. Well, and it's like facing the truth about something. Mm. You know, spending years avoiding a truth, say being unhappy in a marriage or being, you know, not exploring your sexuality and you know you're gay, but you're in a heterosexual relationship. That I, you know, that I meet a lot of those people. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, it's, it feels so scary and painful to face the truth. But ultimately, and you talk about freedom. I mean, my whole thing is about freedom. Mm. It's freedom to be who you want to be, say what you want to say, feel what you want to feel, and behave in the way you're choosing without being totally controlled by the people around you or the external world. And yet, I think so much of that happens unconsciously. We don't even know that we're doing it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's why I talk a lot about fear because, well, we're getting off on the powerful thing because I totally am with you with the getting our power back. Um, and I think fear is a huge, you know, when, I don't know, you do step work or whatever, but I remember mm -hmm. doing some step work at one point when, I listed all my fears and then went back and saw the incidents that contributed to the fears and just that awareness of, oh my gosh, everything I've been doing, whatever I've been saying to people, however I've been behaving in my world, everything is about some fear, whether it's fear of what you think of me, fear of you getting mad at me, fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, fear of, you know whatever there's hundreds and uh, to me it's all those interpersonal fears that people don't have the consciousness around they're just behaving unconsciously all day without having a choice but then what happens is you eventually get really angry or if you're a woman you might get really anxious you know what mm, i mean i mean mm, there's mm. a lot of different pieces to that so, um, and that's all these ways of moving further away from yourself rather than 
if we can start being honest with ourselves, we do become free and we get closer and closer to who we really are. And we don't need to use all those distractions to move away, whether it's substance abuse or in recovery, people use all kinds of other things. I mean, how many people do you meet that, you know, 10 years sober, but they're gambling or they're having affairs or they're, you know, I mean, just because you put the drink down doesn't mean it's not going to manifest somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So but for people listening who really recognize themselves, what, what, what is a, a place to start and a, a way out of this? I mean, it, it, the first thing I had to do was like, I mean, I remember reading all those books about that back then, codependency, no more and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, oh my God, that's me. That's me. That's me. And, yes. and I think people get sober and then this is, a, this is almost always the next thing that comes up. Yes. This, and may, this and maybe food is that we don't know how to be. Uh, one of the things I tell my clients, be, sobriety, really all it is, is being able to deal with other people. <laughs> that's all it is. Just being able to deal with other people. And I would say, though, it's really how to deal with yourself because it's healing with yourself in relationship yeah. with other people. Exactly. So, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is one of the the biggest, and this is why I talk a lot about emotional sobriety, it's being able to deal, all of that is skills and tools yes. to deal with other people. Do you have anything that like you could uh, suggest to people in terms of, I don't know, skills or tools yeah. or where to start. Say is, and I mean, I think you talk about this in your book and I do this in my book with the uh, being able to, how you get to know yourself is you stop. And the trouble with a lot of people I know in recovery is they get busy doing a bunch of other stuff. Mm. So if you can start tolerating five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you talk a lot about journaling, if you can start instead of, it's always bringing it back to yourself. So it's, again, what I said previously, what do I want? What do I need? I mean, many codependent people don't even know what a need is. It's like <laughs> to feel needy or to identify a need feels terrifying. It's much safer to think about what the other person needs. So the first step in codependent recovery is always, what do I feel? What am I experiencing to try and stay? And I know you probably are staying in your own hula hoop to try to just be aware of, even if you're with people, what do I think about this? What do I feel about this? Not if, instead of automatically, very often people when they're in conversation are thinking about how the other person is going to respond. It's always bringing yourself back to your own space. And then if you notice, and I think because I like, I read so much Buddhism and studied Buddhism, like in my early 20 years of recovery, it was always about just noticing your thoughts, right? I mean, so I got huge practice in that spaciousness with your thinking. So I guess I, you know, part of the reason maybe I've stayed sober so long is I really knew early on, we are not our thoughts. And so this idea of, you know, geez, I'm noticing that this person, I, that I'm worried about what they're going to think of me. Geez, what that, what is that about? I need to sit with my feelings, my thoughts, um, what my fears are. A great tool that I've used with people over the years is, and this is a little bit different, is when I have something going on and I can't identify it. What I write across the top of the piece of paper is what am I mad about? What am I sad about? And what am I fearful about? And I just free write. And a lot of times when you look at, and I keep things very simple. I don't consider myself an intellectual. I really keep things, you know, it's fear, sadness, and anger all the time or, you know, and grief. Um, and that really helps you to start looking at, geez, what am I experiencing? What am I feeling? Because again, codependency, just like addiction, is a way to move away from my own feeling experience. Mm -hmm. If I focus on you or my kid or my husband, I don't have to think about my own unhappiness. That's codependency. If I, you know, it's funny because when I was 10 years sober, I went to treatment and it was all around codependency stuff. I was literally. It was the summer between my freshman and sophomore year in graduate school. 
and I was really struggling with some of these issues. And I remember on the board, they said, you know, addicts, um, uh, am I going to get this wrong? Yeah, addicts, 95% kind of trauma, pain, history, 5% addiction, co-addicts, 100% pain issues, blah, blah. And so again, I really think below addictions is all the untreated codependency. We mm -hmm. can use the word codependency or just say, you know, relational issues, pain, trauma, whatever. And with codependence, it's just this lack of, it's really being addicted to people. It's being addicted to other people's response to you and not being able to be yourself. So okay, I just be, let me, being addicted to other people's response to you. Yeah. <gasps> Can you break that down a bit? Yeah, it's like- Like wanting to be approved and liked. Yeah, and all that, of it, not be Wanting approved. just the positive, like- It really depends what your underlying, what your biggest fears are. So if I have a fear of abandonment, I'm gonna be relentlessly preoccupied with the, my partner not abandoning me. So all of my behaviors are not going to be choices. You know, they're going to say, geez, you want to go to such and such movie tonight? And I'm going to say, what do you want to go to? I mean, it's not, it's not huge things. It's an accumulation of small things over time. What do you want to eat tonight? You want to go Italian? No, I'd rather have, you know, uh, you know, okay, sure. Even though I don't like Italian food, it's these tiny little micro. And I say this codependents eventually become like a piece of Swiss cheese because we're all we're doing is outwardly gratifying the other person out of our own fears. And again, going back to the tolerating, if I can speak one small truth, and I talk in the book about saying it to the gal at the coffee shop. So if they give you the wrong coffee, say to yourself, you know, I'll have a fear. Oh, I'll upset them. Now, is that about the coffee person? No, that's about my parents, my history. But can I just ask for my coffee to be made the way I want? That's the beginning. You know, I, I talk about the first two tools being self-care and speaking up for yourself. And it's hard to speak up, but you can practice in smaller ways. You know, speak up with people that you don't have huge emotional attachments to. So eventually you can speak up to your... And it's so ironic when you think about it, Veronica, the people that we love the most, you would think would be the people we can be the most authentic with. But they're the scariest to be the most authentic with. Because they can hurt us the most. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take some words out of your mouth. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Yeah. Sarah, this has just been amazing. Uh, one of our, um, oh, Alicia, the sober curator, she's like, oh, you're going to love her. Oh, and I'm like, oh, my oh, God. Yes, yes, yes. I've written articles for the magazine. She's, yeah. she's a delight. She yeah. is a total delight. Well, she so, yeah. prepped me and said that I'd have a great time with you. And I really have. I, I could, I think we need to ask you back. Would you come back? Because there's Absolutely. so much. I would, yeah. You know, I was going to say too, I love doing groups or workshops or whatever. You know, if you ever want me to do something for your community or whatever, I'd love oh, to. For, for sure. Love for sure. Okay. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Excellent. Okay, so I wanted to everyone to know about Sarah's book, which I just think I'm going to actually add this to my reading list. I haven't finished it yet. But I'm about halfway through, but I am going to add this to my uh, reading list. Perfect. It's called Co Crazy One Psychologist's Recovery from Codependency and Addiction, a memoir and roadmap to freedom by Dr. Excellent. Sarah Michaud. Am I saying that right? You um, you. Where, yeah. where else can people find you? Oh, right. Okay, so I do a little YouTube channel called Leaving Crazy Town. Um, my partner is a transgendered sober attorney named Finn, and he's a delight. And speaking of, oh my gosh, this is going to give you a huge example of codependency recovery. When I met him, he was a woman and he was married to a woman. And we, he got in one of my codependency groups and, and the group is about being who you really are. And in that group, he discovered over time that he really was a man. And this is like, an, this is an extreme example, but this is what I'm talking about when I talk about freedom. 
he over time transitioned and now we do this um we do a podcast and uh just started doing that and this youtube channel and it's all about we have fun but we talk about really deep topics but in a joyous way so because we we have a pretty good sense of humor so leaving crazy town on youtube uh we just started this podcast which i'd love to have you on it's um the same thing leaving crazy town and that's on different podcast channels. I have a website, drsaramisho.com, and I write articles for the Sober Curator, which is an online sober magazine. So those are all the places. Brilliant, brilliant. And we'll, yes. we'll, we'll put all of that in the show notes. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Ronnie, Sarah. You are a delight. Thank you so same, much. Same, same. I know yes. this good. I know people are going to love this. So Excellent. I can't wait for it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for it to go out. Let Thank everybody. You, my friend. Let everyone know what, what they think uh, when uh, they listen and you hear it. Uh, please let me know.